Ta? Okay, very good. So uh, let me make, maybe before I forget, make just a small announcement for next week. So next week we do Kitaev's paper. Uh, I think uh, Kitaev's paper has two main parts. One is a billion anions and one is nanobillion. We will not do the nanobillion stuff. So what we will do is we'll discuss sections one, two, up to the end of section two, and then we'll discuss some of the figures. We will not discuss in particular section five, that's too tough. And uh, so if someone wants to present something from section five, you can, of course. Uh, but um, but uh, just to warn you, you might panic a little bit. And so we'll stay with section one and two that are easy, but each sentence is very dense. So you will need to read and say, A, obviously commute with B because they share two lines. And you have to think a bit, draw some picture. Then you're okay, it's true. Then the next sentence, another very dense stuff. So all sentences are correct, sharp, clean, but it's dense. So even though we'll stop at page eight, there's a lot in those eight pages. So, so don't leave it to the last minute, but also don't be worried that we are not going to discuss the nanobillion anion part, except the figures, in particular figure six with the ribbons and so on. That I will try to discuss a little bit. Okay, and today, and so, to, so, so next week it will be a normal class, so with eight pages we can do it in the normal time. Today I think this is a very interesting paper, but that requires a little bit of background. So the plan, like I wrote on Google Classroom, is I will give some background for 30, 40 minutes, we stop, we take a coffee, and then 30, 40 minutes more, the paper itself. Okay. Any question here? So I just wrote here a few notes just to remind ourselves of a bunch of things. So, so let me start maybe by recalling the problem of electrostatics. <clears throat> so in electrostatics, what do we, we do? We have some potential, V, that depends on R, say. We take the divergence of this potential, and this is the electric field, right? And then the divergence of the electric field is equal to the charges, whatever charges there are, and we could imagine some charges, qi, inserted at positions delta of r minus ri. Okay. So I want just to make a few comments. So normally, this is a three-dimensional delta function. We put some particles in space. R is a point in R3. We have charges in R3, a bunch of point particles <coughs> in R3. And these Q are our charges. Also, this potential is basically just by dimensional analysis, 1 over r to the power d minus 2, which is 1 over r in usual three dimensions. And therefore, the force is 1 over r squared, which is the usual Coulomb force. OK. So today, we will encounter a small modification of this formalism, where instead of 3D, we'll go to 2D. So let me remind you what, is, what changes in electrostatic when you do two dimensions. In two dimensions, the force, instead of being 1 over r squared, is just 1 over r, and the potential is logarithmic. So in 2D, the potential V behaves as logarithm of r. This is such that indeed Laplacian of this potential gives delta function, and so if I have a bunch of Qs, my potential is a sum of logs of r minus ri. Any question? All clear. 
Okay. It's important to note that we could do two dimensions on a genus G surface. Then we would have a genus G surface. And on this genus G surface, there is, again, some points parameterized by R, where R is a two-dimensional uh, point on this surface. It doesn't need to be the plane. We can put the theory on a sphere or on a genus G surface. And what generalizes this equation would be the statement that the Laplacian of the potential is equal to the sum of QI, two-dimensional charges, R minus Ri, where this Laplacian is the Laplacian on the torus. <clears throat> now, one more generalization we are going to do is instead of having a single electric field, we will imagine, and instead of having a single type of charge QI, we are going to imagine that the charges QI have an extra index mu, so there are many types of charges. In bosonic string, there will be 26 types of charges. And so this vector E would have an extra index mu, <clears throat> and the my electric field, in this case, solving that equation, would be the sum over I of QI times the propagator between R and Ri, where this propagator obeys the equation that Laplacian of this propagator is equal to delta function. So this would be just a general solution of the electrostatic problem. This propagator in an infinite plane is just a log. Otherwise, it's a complicated function that lives on a genus G surface that obeys this equation. That I have to find. Any question here? Is it clear? So this is just a review of standard electrostatics, just adding a few ingredients. The slight unusual ingredient is that the electric field now has an index mu. Otherwise, it's the usual electrostatics. And what would be the energy of this configuration? The energy, I remind you that the energy is the integral of the electric field. <clears throat> okay. But actually, let me, okay. And then the energy would be this quantity here. OK, so that's one thing I wanted to review as background, is that in the paper, often we write equations, and we say, this is like electrostatics. And if you, are, if you, are, if you didn't refresh your memory for what the equations for electrostatics look like, you could be a little bit confused in recognizing that some statements are indeed electrostatics of particles. So I think this is going to be useful. OK. A second thing I wanted to recall. That's right. Yeah, you integrate over the full space, over the genus surface, yeah. Yeah, you integrate over your 2D surface. Now, let's recall how do we normally compute energy in a path integral. 
So I remind you that, for example, in a path integral, one way to compute the energy is to compute the, the path integral over uh, some field, phi, e to the minus, and then we could have some quadratic term. Let me write like this. We are in two dimensions. We have d2x, d2y. Let me write the kinetic term like this. Phi of x, the inverse of the propagator between x and y, phi of y. Right? That's the definition of the propagator. The propagator is the inverse of whatever is in the kinetic term. So I'll write it like this. And now, suppose I have some extra charges. And so if I have some extra charges, I would put here some integral over x. And then I would say I have some charges, qi, uh, or some, some current, j of x, phi of x. OK? So I want to remind you that this quantity here, if I do this path integral, I'm saying that I'm coupling my system to some sources. So this is computing e to the minus the energy times time, if I evolve it for a long time, where this would be the energy in the presence of these sources. Do you agree? So if I just evolve it in a long time, if time is big, it's just the ground state, and now it's the ground state in the presence of this source. And what is this computation? Well, if I just complete the square, this is just equal to the integral, to basically, I just complete the square, and then I integrate over phi, so I get e to the j of x, propagator x and y, j of y, where I integrate over x and over y. And in particular, if I put a bunch of point-like sources, if I say that my sources are just a bunch of delta functions inserted at some position ri with some charge qi, <clears throat> then uh, this object will become just the exponential of the sum over i and j of qi, qj, and the propagator from position where charge i is to position where charge j is. And usually, we don't, we have to regulate this a little bit. This propagator normally blows up when i is equal to j, and we kind of throw away those i equal j contributions, and we go to some expression like this. And this is, of course, the usual expression, where this g was nothing but my potential, and this is just exponential of two charges multiplied by the electric potential. So that's the usual Coulomb energy between particles, if I apply it to our problem. Okay? So this would be... The, this is the potential. And so this would be exactly what uh, we would like. OK. Hmm. So that's one comment I wanted to make, that uh, these Gaussian integrations, when we have a Gaussian integral and a linear term, the Gaussians are trivial to do and we reproduce the energy of a bunch of particles. One more background comment I would like uh, to make. And so, maybe before, let me just emphasize that uh, we will see, for example, that because we have these different charges with index mu, what will appear here will really be the dot product between the charges times the Coulomb 
potential. So this will be the type of problem that we will be facing. But for now, I'm just reviewing general stuff. So the second thing I wanted to remind you is that string theory is defined perturbatively by a recipe to compute its amplitudes, its scattering amplitudes. It's a bit like the analog of defining a field theory by giving you the Feynman rules. If you give me all the Feynman rules, you define the theory perturbatively, right? Then you can just apply the Feynman rules to compute any process you want. So there are Feynman rules for string theory that work like this. <laughs> you say that you have your string theory, and you consider a surface with a given genus. So this would be an example of a string theory contribution at genus 2. So this would be an amplitude for a scattering process at genus g equal 2. That would depend on the Mandelstam invariance of my process. We are going to discuss this in one second. And this would be given by what? It would be given by the integral over all shapes of the Riemann surface. The integral over all embeddings of the surface in space-time. And then exponential of minus some action that depends on x. And then a product of vertex operators that I insert at some positions are i. In this case, there are four of them. And this action is roughly the integral on that metric dx dx. So you see it's Gaussian. That's the important thing. And this v is some prefactor that's not important. And then it's exponential of q this vi of qi dot x inserted at ri. So what I want to emphasize is that up to details, we are exactly in this scenario where we have a Gaussian integration and a linear term. The linear term comes from the vertex operators. And this Q is the momentum of particle i. So it's a vector qi, where qi square is the mass of the particle. <coughs> X is the shape of the surface. So I have some surface. And a point is a given x. We call this the target space. It's a map from some to some point in target space. So this x, there are 26 components because the string can move in 26 dimensions, the bosonic string we are discussing. And then it depends on some coordinates that I can use, for example, z and z bar, that define my map from some two-dimensional z, z bar. Perhaps some torus that we identify, for example, this edge with this edge, this edge with this edge. And it would map a torus to a given torus in target space. OK. So let me just recap. Let me just remind you that this action, this type of quadratic action, came from something very natural, which is the generalization of just the length of a curve. So the length of this curve is the integral of square root of x dot square ds. 
which is parameterization invariant. S is whatever parameter I use. If you change to another S prime, of course, this is invariant because we have X prime squared ds. And if you generalize this towards the area swept by a string, you would get a similar expression where now you would have some integral ds dt, where s now could be this and t could be this, some two coordinates, and it doesn't matter what I use, like here it doesn't matter. But instead of x dot square, we would get square root of a determinant of del alpha x mu del beta x mu. So this is just adding up a little bit of small area elements. If you think a little bit, this determinant is computing the area of a small segment ds times dt. And this determinant, alpha and beta, it's a two by two matrix where alpha takes value s and t and beta as well. <coughs> and now this area here, it's a complicated thing to work with this guy, like it is a complicated thing to work with this guy because of this square root. But these actions, classically at least, are equivalent. There is an equivalence between these two. This is what's called Nambugoto, and this is what's called Polyakov. And a very simple idea, if you want to go from Polyakov to Nambugoto, is say that I'm integrating over metrics, but metrics are not dynamical fields because they have no derivatives, and so I can just integrate them by their equations of motion. You write the equations of motion for G and you plug it here, and you get that this action becomes Nambugot. So here, we go from here to here, integrating the metric out. But in practice, this formulation is just another way of computing the area by introducing some metric in the same way that here, you can also compute this action. You can go from this action to one where you just do x dot square without the square root. But I remind you that this would not be a good action. Why not? Why can't I just write this? What would be the obvious problem with this action versus this? Right? So this one is not reparameterization invariant. If I change s to s prime, it transforms. So what I can do is I can put a metric on my segment. So I put a metric, E of s, which now is just a function. It's called the Heinbein or Ilbein or whatever. There's some name that I forget. And this transforms in a way that this metric element, E of s times ds, transforms as the inverse of x dot square to make it invariant. So it's your choice. You pick whatever metric you want here. And now you would, get, you would be able to integrate it out and go from one to the other. OK? So more precisely, if you would have like this, you would write an action You would write this action. And we can even do it by head, that if you integrate out this metric, what are the equations of motion? It's x dot square minus m squared over e squared equals 0, the derivative with respect to e. So e is the square root of, it's 1 over the square root of this guy. I plug e equal 1 over the square root. I get back the square root there. Okay? So we go from here to here by plugging the solution of the equation of motion. And the equations of motion are just x dot square minus m square over e square equal to 0. I plug e here, and I go back to that action there. Right. So I can work either with a square root formula, which is the length, or with an extra metric. But then I need to integrate. I can also integrate over this matrix, and it doesn't matter. It's just an auxiliary metric that tells me on the line how did I decide to space the points. Maybe I chose to put many points here and then less points here. And choosing a different way to parameterize gives me a different E. And uh, we can also, this would be Polyakov, this would be Nambugoto. This is Nambugoto, and it's an area, and this is Polyakov. <laughs> so the basic idea is that we have some integration in string theory, like this. 
And their basic observation is that if the queues are very large, we are putting some huge sources. So this is going to be dominated by saddle point because the action is going to become very big. You are sourcing a huge, you are doing a huge kick in your action. So when these queues are very, very big vectors, this is very, you are injecting a huge source. And we don't care about these prefactors. These are details. We only care about what's in the exponent, which is the action, which is quadratic, and which is these charges. But then, uh, if, you, if you see, this is nothing but the Laplace. The, the propagator of this is nothing but the Laplacian. So we go exactly back to those class of problems there. Okay, and that's uh, how studying string theory in the very high energy limit when the queues are very large will be basically just looking at the Gaussian part and doing this. Then we'll end up with some electrostatic where these R's will be the positions of the vertex operators. And then we'll ask, what are these positions? And this will be about minimizing this energy to finding the optimal saddle point solutions. <clears throat> OK. So there's one more nice thing that they discuss that I just want to mention that it exists, which is that sometimes there is a connection between counting critical points. Critical points, by this I mean counting extrema, or if you want, counting equilibrium conditions. Not necessarily maxima, could be settled points and so on. And the field of counting extrema and topology. So this connection, one of the fields of mathematics that study this connection is Morse theory. So let me just give an example of Morse theory that I learned uh, when I was preparing this that I think is cute to know it exists. So let's count, say, on... Uh, so the first, yeah, let's count. Let's, imagine, let's draw something with the topology of a sphere. For example, something like a, a football ball. And maybe let me deform it a little bit and say, I'll do like this. And now let's look at this surface and look at the maxima and minima of this surface. So there is a maxima here. And the maxima is, is, is described by having two directions that are negative, one and two. Then there are two minima here, and the minima are parameterized by having zero negative directions. They have, uh, here you have two negative directions, here you have zero negative directions. Both directions are positive. And here we have a settle point where two directions are negative and two directions are positive. One. One direction is positive, and, two are, and one is negative, and two are positive. So let's count. Let's do the following. Let's count the number of critical points. We sum over all critical points. And we put minus 1 to the number of negative directions. So let's do it. How many maxima do we have? One maxima. And the maximum comes with critical, with two negative directions, times minus one square. Plus, how many saddle points? One saddle point, and it comes with minus one to the number, which is one. And then we have two minima with minus one to the zero. So how much do we get? 
So this and this cancel, we get two. And two is the Euler characteristic of the sphere. And the statement is that you would always get two. If it's a sphere, no matter how you deform, you always get two. Now what we could do is make this into a torus, for example, putting a hole here. And now you would have, let's draw in green, two extra saddle points, right? Two extra points where we have some negative and positive. And so now we would get here in the saddle point here, right? Instead of one, this would become three in the case of the torus. And in that case, these two would become zero. And this is the Euler characteristics of the torus. More precisely, the Euler characteristic for a surface of genus G is 2 minus 2G. So this is a connection between a simple topological property, the Euler characteristic of a surface, that's just the genus of the surface, and you see it relates to number of extrema. So this is a very simple toy model, but this, for example, has the following implication, that if I put, for example, four charges on a torus, and now I look for extrema, for saddle points or maxima, see how many equilibrium positions there are, and I want to count how many equilibrium positions, this type of technology tells me that there are 64 equilibrium positions. Right. So it's cute. It's not obvious. It requires more work. But it's cute that such field exists of topology that uh, you ask how many charges I can put on the torus, how many solutions are there. The answer is 64. OK. OK. okay. The last thing I want to recall is that there exists different types of large energy. It's very important to have in mind that when we discuss large energy in physics, there are various different types of large energy. So let's recall that these Mandelstam variables, S, one of them is the incoming energy square. And this is basically the energy of the center of mass square. Because if I go to a frame where I'm scattering at the center of mass, Q1 and Q2 are just energy P, energy minus P, so it's twice the energy, so it's basically the center of mass energy square. Right? And then T, which is Q1 plus Q3 square, is basically equal to S, or to minus S, times 1 plus cosine of theta over 2, if you remember from one of the presentations of one of the students. <clears throat> and so large energy means S to infinity. But you see that there are clearly two very different things you can do. When you take S to infinity, do we take T to infinity as well, or do we keep T fixed? So we can take S to infinity and keep T over S fixed. Or we can take S to infinity and keep T fixed. You can do more things, but these two clearly are very different. This one means that we scatter at huge energy at fixed angle. The angle is fixed. So we scatter something at huge energy against each other, and we ask what's the amplitude for getting things at some fixed angle out. The other one, we scatter at huge energy, but we keep T fixed. That means that this angle, I flipped the sign here, if you are taking notes. It means that this angle is very close to zero. And so a T fixed and very large energy means almost forward scattering. So we scatter at very high energy. 
and these particles are barely deflected. So theta is of order 1 over square root s. So this is very different. In one case, we really have this scattering, which is very, very strong, this effect. In the other case, things can be scattering at huge energy, but barely deflect with each other. Okay? And so these are two very important different physical regimes. And this paper is about this one. Um. Okay, let's make a, I think this was the background I wanted to summarize so that, but let's maybe stop for questions here. And then now that we have all this background in mind, all these tools refreshed, we can now go into the, the paper itself, which is really quite beautiful and it will now be easier to go through. So the plan now is take a coffee while I erase everything and we start now with clean blackboards going through the paper. Okay, so if there are no questions, let's take a three minute break.
Okay, um, so let's get started. So, so let's try to collect some of the nice observations um, made uh, in this paper. So let's start with uh, formula number one, which is 2.1. And let's combine it with an expression that appears a bit later. So here, what we are saying is, let's compute the three-level sphere contribution. Okay? So this was the integration over all moduli that describe a sphere, the integration over all fields that describe this embedding of the sphere of four vertex operators, and then the action of the string. And if you do this, you reduce all these integrations, if you want a very explicit expression, you reduce all these integrations, you work all these integrations out, and you end up with the equation 3.2. And then this equation 3.2, if you compute, gives 2.1. And 3.2, the integral that you get is the following. You get an integral over d2 lambda exponential of minus um, t plus 16 log absolute value of lambda minus u plus 16 log of 1 minus absolute value of lambda with some one quarter, multiplying everything. <clears throat> Where I just remind you that u is not independent from the s and t because they add up to 4m square, which in this case is 4. Uh, no, this is some Tekian scattering would be minus 4. I'm not sure about the notation they use, but it probably is. <clears throat> so, let's comment on how did we go from this expression to this expression, just to give you a flavor if you are not a string theorist. So, what is happening in going from here to here? So, these Vs, they were, as we said, exponentials of Qs dot Xs. We integrated them out and we got exponentials of propagators. Right? Charges times propagators, like we saw. The propagators are just the propagators on the sphere. They are just logs. So we get log of R1 minus R2, log of R2 minus R3, log of R4 minus R5, uh, R1, log of all the separations. But then at the end, we don't have position 1, 2, 3, 4. We have a single one. Why? Because when you have four points, by a conformal transformation, you can fix three of them. So when you integrate over the moduli of the sphere, you can, with transformations of the sphere, fix three points. So more specifically, what you do is you integrate over the volume of equivalent spheres. And so basically, the variables that you have, you start your life integrating over R1, R2, R3, and another position, R4. But in the end, you can fix this guy to be 0, this one to be 1, this one to be infinity, this 4 to be lambda. And then you just integrate over the position of lambda, where lambda would become x plus i, y would be the location of this point. 
in the complex plane. Any question here? So we had x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x1 minus x4, but only x4 remains, all the other ones we fix. And so we see this, for example, came from distance between point 0.4 and point 0.1. This came from distances between point 0.4 and point 0.2. So in the end, the, in the remaining of those integrations are just this integral over lambda. OK? So for the sphere, there are no other moduli. It's just about the position of the puncture. OK, but that's, a, that's not crucial. So that is just how this type of expression became this. No approximation at this point. And now, this integration over two dimensions we can just do. It's a two-dimensional integral. You just do this, and you check that this is nothing but a bunch of gamma functions. And so at the end, the result becomes this equation 2.1, which is the amplitude for a string, which is there is some overall normalization, and then some gamma function in the notation they have minus 1 minus s over 8, gamma minus 1 minus t over 8, gamma minus 1 minus u over 8, divided by a bunch of gamma functions with plus sign, which is 2 plus s over 8, gamma of 2 plus t over 8, gamma of 2 plus u over 8. OK. And now you can ask, what happens when s, when these variables goes to infinity with ratios fixed? <coughs> And how do you do this? You do it either by going to this expression and just using Stirling approximation to expand gamma functions. So you just know that gamma of x becomes x to the x, da, 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 right? You just do Stirling approximation for n factorial. Or you go here and say u and t are very large. I find the optimal location lambda that gives me the saddle point of this integral, and I get exponential of something. Right? So at this point, you could do both computations. Either look here directly, if you don't want to work with gamma functions. Just go here and find the optimal, find the lambda star that uh, minimizes this action. Or you just apply Stirling approximation to this gamma functions. And in either case, you would conclude that you would get exponential the following result. It would be exponential using the angle that we introduced before. You could write it in the following way. I like to write it with the angle. Exponential of s over 4. So I'm now writing equation 2.2, but only keeping the dominant terms. They keep subleading terms, which is not really very logical, but OK. And then sine square of the angle. Remember, fixed angle, like we said, logarithm of sine square of the angle, plus the same with sine replaced by cosine. <clears throat> and so, let's see what's happening here. So this uh, is the behavior at large energy. And this is log of a number between 0 and 1. So this is negative, right? You agree? This is negative. This is positive. So this is going to 0. So this result is exponentially small. L let me make a comment that you could take s over t fixed. Let's call this r. 
And then, uh, remember, r is minus 1 minus cosine of the angle over 2. And so this r is negative for a physical experiment. But you could analytically continue and consider the case where r is positive. So this would go to r bigger than 0 under a rotation where phi goes to i phi. So that's just an unphysical regime where I study my amplitude at t positive and not t negative. When phi goes to i phi, you see that this becomes i cinch, so this picks a minus sign. This becomes um, Well, we have to analyze everything, but the punchline I want to make is that in this case, this result here would go to infinity, and it would be exponentially large and not small. So that's very different, right? Getting something exponentially big or exponentially small is very different. And so I think the expectation, for example, is that large NQCD as this universal behavior, but not this, for example. That's some of the, paper, the recent papers that cite this discuss this. Can it be that this regime, because it's exponentially large, it's more robust than this? If you have something being exponentially small, any small disturbance you do that creates an order one effect hides this. But if you have an exponentially big effect, you could imagine that that should be very robust. It's hard to kill it and replace it by something else. So it's possible, perhaps, that all large n gauge theories, because they are all string theories, that they have this behavior. So that's uh, a possibility that some people believe. That if I take a glue ball scattering amplitude at very large energies at fixed angle, it would be exponentially large in this unphysical regime, this very highly boosted regime. That could be important, because We often do, remember, uh, the simplest example we saw in class was, for example, just poles. Poles happen at unphysical energies. A pole, for example, is manifested by the presence of a pole, S minus M square, where M is below twice M, which is the physical energy. So when we scatter, physical energy start here. At 2M, there is a cut. And scattering at physical energies, we are here. But we do like to go to one physical regions, for example, to learn about the spectrum of the theory. So there is a lot of information in unphysical regions of my amplitude, not just in the physical region. This is an extreme case where not only we go to one physical stuff, but we decide to go to infinity in the unphysical direction. OK, so it's a bit funny, but we could do it. <coughs> Speaking of poles, note that this guy has many poles because gamma functions have lots of poles. So this guy is full of poles when s over 8 is 0, when s over 8 is 1, when s over 8 is 2, when s over 8 is 3. There are infinitely many poles. These are just the infinitely many particles that string theory has. The infinitely many vibration modes of string theory are all these poles of this gamma function. Yeah? So, so this amplitude the analytic properties in terms of S are precisely that. There are infinitely many poles. Which is exactly what we saw in Witten's paper when we were describing large N. And we were saying that if I scatter two glue balls, there will be an infinite amount of glue balls. Uh, why? Because we saw that it's the only way we could get a logarithmic behavior at high energy. That's why we had an infinite amount of mesons and so on. Notice that this amplitude is not unitary. Namely, there are poles, so it blows up. That's because we are doing a three-level approximation. If we were to resum this and do all loops, the probability here would never blow up. It would be finite. Okay. 
the meeting has ended after 40 minutes idle time, it says here. The microphone? No, no, it's Ah, I forgot to put it. Yeah. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's. So, obrigado, thank you. Uh, okay, so, so this theory, this approximation at three level is not unitary because uh, we have all these infinitely many poles. Like we discussed, they are going to become resonances that if I were to do resum perturbation theory. It is not polynomially bounded, this theory. Indeed, I just showed you that it's exponentially large. And uh, so it's different from field theory, where in field theory, this type of behavior that we expect, instead of exponentially small, we expect versus a power law behavior, as in usual quantum field theory. And the fact that usually in quantum field theory you expect a power law behavior, the coefficient of that power law knows about physics at all energies. So let me remind you something basic, that for example, computing the total absorption cross-section of protons at the LHC is very hard. If I scatter proton with proton, and I ask, uh, what's the probability, what's the total particle production? It's very hard. People try to fit experimentally. It's S to the 1.3 or something like that. Super hard to predict the large energy behavior. Because it's not, you could think, oh, it's QCD. It's going to become free. It's going to become easy. But no, the behavior at large energy every, it receives contributions from all energies, all the way from low to high energy. It's, it's an effect that is integrated over all energies, and all energies matter. Very different here. Here, the contribution at high energy is localized at a settled point. It's just a classical solution. It's a single classical solution that is contributing at large energy. So that's a huge difference. So this is being dominated by a single classical solution. By this, we mean settled point versus all energies contributing as in usual quantum field theory. Okay, so that's very, very different. <clears throat> OK, so going on with the, uh, so we have this amplitude. It has this funny, very important high energy behavior that behaves very differently from quantum field theory. Of course, the motivation of the paper is let's study high energy to see what space time is made of. If string theory is supposed to be a theory of everything, it's at high energy that we should start seeing interesting stuff. For example, these power laws in quantum field theory in momentum space are the counterpart of the usual operator product expansion in position space. The, things that, the fact that things behave as powers at short distances, you convert to momentum and it becomes powers in momentum, right? It's just Fourier transform. And so powers in position are the signal of, OP, of, uh, of, um, of operator product expansion. When you start getting logs, it's a signal of asymptotic freedom that you start getting this running with logs. So there's usual lots of physics in this high energy behavior of, uh, of amplitudes, and they are trying to look for the analog physics in string theory. Okay. Next, they make a comment and they try to estimate what could be the amplitude if I do a genus G process? <clears throat> and they say that one way to estimate it is imagining that this looks like a sequence of three level processes where instead of exchanging T, you remember, is the momentum transfer. You could imagine that I don't transfer the momentum all at once, but I transfer some momentum here, T1, some momentum transfer here, T2, and some momentum transferred here, T3. So this will give me some intuition that this amplitude at the genus 2 would be something like a product of three three-level amplitudes, 
j equals 0, j equals 0, j equals 0. All of them with the same s, the center of mass energy would be conserved. But this one with t1, this one with t2, this one with t3. And then you would ask, let's extremize over the distribution over this ti to get the one that would dominate. And this basically would tell you that the expectation would be to get the three-level amplitude with general s and t raised to the power of 1 over the genus plus 1. You find that the t is roughly capital, the total t over g plus 1. And then when you plug it into the expression for the area with those logs and so on, you would, exp you would make a guess that this could be perhaps the behavior. Okay? So this is, if you want, a heuristic guess. Okay? It's a guess that you can make because you did the computation and you know it's true. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be hard to, ah, it's probably just like this. And it's true. This is going to be correct. But of course, they would never guess it. I think they would never start writing these things if they had not done the computation. Okay? And so this guess is not just, it's a good, turns out to be a good guess. And indeed, we will find that the genus G amplitude is just a three-level amplitude raised to this power. So they want to point out that because of this, um, you see that uh, it is not true that I can just uh, drop uh, these processes. A priori, if I want to study these uh, this, this processes, I will need to resum all this perturbation theory and to get the amplitude at all genus, we would get something like the sum over genus some amplitude to the power 1 over 1 plus genus, and then some coefficient, some number that could depend on the genus that would be very hard to compute. But the idea is that if you were to resum this, this would be the full amplitude non-perturbative. So of course, that's their goal, is to say what is the non-perturbative prediction for a theory of quantum gravity at very large energies. Any question? OK. So, so let's then try to set up the problem in general. So here we did it on an example. It motivated what we want to do. Now we want to go back to this general expression here and to claim, based on this general expression, that the amplitude for genus G, the contribution at genus G, is approximately given by the exponential of minus one half sum over I and j, qi dot qj times the propagator between points ri and rj, exactly this electrostatic, electrostatic problem that we described. This would be some energy for n particles. For us, n is 4, always. And there could be many such optimal solutions. We should take the optimal one. We should minimize over these charges to find which one would give the optimal solution. The other ones would give actions that are more suppressed. Where g 
is the propagator or the potential. that we saw before. <clears throat> okay. So let's write an example. For example, the energy at the genus zero for n equals four. Let's also use the fact that we have the following Q dot q, q1 dot q2, for example. This is just q1 plus q2 square over 2 minus q1 square minus q2 square. But this is basically s that's going to infinity. And this is the mass of the particles that is finite compared to s. So we can always drop this. In other words, at very high energy, this part, this mass, I can effectively replace it by zero. They are moving very fast. And so what do we get? We get that this q1 dot q2, for example, would be just q1 plus q2, which is just s times logarithm of R1 minus R2, right? What about 1, 2? What about 3, 4? 3, 4, it would be Q3 dot Q4. That's also Q3 plus Q4. That's also S, right? So there is another term, which would be R3 minus R4, also inside the log. That would contribute in the same way, right? Just another log. Then there is plus, there is T log of R1 minus R3. Let me use this notation, R2 minus R4. And then U times the other combination, R1, 4, R2, 3. So this would be the energy for these particles. And now, the idea is fix R4 to minimize this energy. What about R1, R2, R3? Like I said, it's not important. They are just moduli. But imagine you did not know. What would you do? You would take derivative with respect to R4, find an R4 critical, plug it here, and see that R1, R2, and R3 disappeared. So you don't need to know this. You can believe me when I tell you that you can fix three points. Or if you don't know, you take derivative of this with respect to R4, find R4, plug it here, and you get, a final, you get the result. And the result you get, once you do this, is just S log S plus T log T plus U log U which, when you go to angles, becomes the expression we wrote there. <coughs> yes. Yes. The question is if I'm minimizing with respect to what? To the positions, of course. We have charges, and they can go to any position. Any question here? Is it clear? Now, notice that the problem becomes very interesting when we do higher genus. Now, higher genus, we have charges that we put there. But the shape of the higher genus surface could also change. And that is something we also minimize over. So it's like a surface. We have a donut. Donuts, there are many types of donuts. There are very fat donuts. There are donuts like a bicycle uh, wheels that are very thin. There are many types of donuts, right? And we put points on the donuts, and we find the optimal shape of the donut plus location of the charge to give the optimal energy. So now the, en the maximization is over shape of the donut and location of the charges. 
So it's an electrostatic problem where you plug charges on Riemann shapes, on Riemann surfaces. You let the Riemann surfaces change their shape without any energy cost, and you find the optimal location of the charges. <clears throat> but okay, so this is just the three-level result. So this is the review of three-level. And I would like to describe a little bit uh, genus one, which is the torus. I think it's nice because I think some of the things about describing torus is useful beyond string theory. So it's something that could be useful for you. So let's think about the torus. How do we do electrostatics when we have a torus? This could be relevant, right? We could have some material that is, has the topology of a torus. How do I do electrostatic there? So we have to describe a torus. So first, again, just to summarize, g equals 0 is equal to a sphere. But I remind you the sphere is just a complex plane. Right? So the complex plane is basically the same as a sphere, right? You can map any point of the sphere to a point in the plane. Plane and sphere is the same thing. How do we describe tori? Right? If I want to describe torus, what's a good description of torus? So there are two ways of describing torus, and they use both. Let's start with the most conventional one. A torus is just like a cylinder with two identifications instead of one. So one way of describing a torus is by saying, I have my complex plane. And then uh, I identify this line with this, and this, and this, and then this line with this, 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 and so on. So you see that this is a torus as well. So this is precisely a torus, of, uh, such that when I do, when I go around like this, for example, it would correspond to, say, this. If I would go around like this, it would correspond to, say, this. And you see these points identified with this, so I can either go here, or if I want to consider going around twice, for example, I can draw this, for example, by saying I go to the next one, and I and I'm here. This point is the same as this, which is the same as this. So this line would be wrapping twice the yellow line I wrap once. And in the torus, I can always fix this point to be 0, this point to be 1, and then this is a complex point, tau. Tau could be i, then this domain is a square, or it can be 1 plus i, then it's like this. And different taus are different tori. Right? So this tori is not the same as this tori, which is like a bicycle wheel, right? So these are different. That means they have different taus. But the punchline is that the torus is nothing but a complex plane modulo a lattice with identifications, that this is identified with this, with this, and so on. So that's one description of the torus. And now, what we have to do here, we have to put four charges here. Right? So we have to put four charges. Let me draw them uh, like this. We have to put these four charges there in an equilib electrostatic equilibrium position in this plane. In other words, I have to put four particles here or here, if you want, in this picture. I have to put charges here and make sure they are in equilibrium. And so they have this very beautiful idea. So first of all, you could ask, how many solutions are there? How many equilibrium solutions are there? How many ways are there of putting charges in equilibrium? So they say there are 64 solutions. They even describe it a little bit. I, I could not follow this. If one of you wants to present this argument, even if it's not very recent, I think this would be a nice thing to discuss. Why there are 64 solutions? It's this Morse theory, blah, 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 that I said before. But OK, 
there are some solutions. But they say clearly one is the most beautiful of all because it's very symmetric. And that's probably the one that gives the optimal energy. Okay. And then they say, we tested numerically a few of the other 63, and indeed they have bigger energy. <laughs> I don't know if anyone tested all the 63, <laughs> but okay. So they describe one that clearly works. So first they say, we are going to put four charges. The first one, it doesn't matter where I put. I can translate it anywhere in the complex plane. So they say, put the first one at the origin. Now, putting it at the origin, recall that it means automatically that you are putting it at all these images, right? Because all these points are identified. Do you agree? And now, they say, oh, but now there is an obvious place of where I can put the charge that is in equilibrium. I'll just go to the middle here and put the other one here in the middle. This one clearly is equilibrated by the other four. And then by putting this here, it means, of course, putting it here and here and here and here and here and here. So now we already put two of these charges. But now you see, look at this four, for example, here. It's clear that, again, by symmetry, you can put one here in the middle, exactly in the middle of the line. And that's, again, will be, by symmetry, a solution. And finally, you can put the other one here. Okay. So again, just focus on the fundamental domain. We can just focus on this fundamental domain. Here are the location of the charges. And that's the proposal. The proposal is that we can put the charges at zero, one half, tau over two, and one plus tau over two. This should be an electrostatic equilibrium position. So now, you just plug this suggestion into this energy. Now you know the taus, but the propagator now on the torus depends on the modulus of the torus tau. Right? And now what you do is you minimize over tau the energy that depends on tau to find the optimal torus. And this will give you what? It will give, after all this computation, full of propagators of the torus, which are some theta functions and a complicated mass, you get exactly the same result as we got here, this yellow result, over 1 plus 1. Okay. Exactly matching their guess that it would be 3 level divided by 1 plus the genus. <clears throat> so there is another way of describing tori that I think is very useful to know that it exists, which is another way of describing Riemann surfaces. So here, this is one description of Riemann surfaces. There is another one. Another, another description of Tori. So let's solve the problem differently. Describing a torus like this. The torus can also be described by the following. I write the surface y square equal z minus a1, z minus a2 over z minus a3, z minus a4. Let me explain this. So here, what do I mean? I mean this is a curve. Given a z, you get a y. More precisely, you get y, which is plus or minus the square root of this. So actually, given a z, you get two y's. 
So let's draw a picture. The picture is that we draw the complex plane, and we will mark these points, A1, A2, A3, A4. So let's mark these points, A1, A2. Let's put, say here, A3 and A4. And then uh, this is the complex plane Z. But when we are at a given point Z, what is the value of Y? It's plus or minus the square root. So the way I should draw it is say there are two sheets. And there are cuts that connect this. Like a square root cut, I go around the point and square root goes to minus square root. Where here I have y, here I have minus y compared to that y. And then uh, I have this cut that connect the lower and the upper sheet. So what are we doing here? We are saying that the complex plane was just a sphere. The other complex plane was just a sphere. Como? Está a acabar? Vão precisar da sala? Mas é, é aqui que vai ser? Às três. Está bom. Mas aqui? Pensava que era no, online. Eu ia chegar três minutos atrasado. Acho que é online. Mas é online. O Nathan não está aqui, então com certeza é online. Pois, deve ser na sala dele, não? Eu acho que é online. Não... Tá bom. And what we did is we had these two spheres, and then uh, we connected them. But if you just connect with one cut, that's still a sphere. Right? It still has the topology of a sphere, right? It's just uh, something like this, right? This is still a sphere. What you need to do is put an extra handle to get a torus. And that's what the other cut does. So that's another way of describing the torus. The torus is described by this surface here. And now, it's obvious what is the analog of those charges. The analog of putting the operators at these funny locations is the same as putting the charges at the branch points. And the reason, the reason you see, is that what did it correspond to do this yellow line? This was a full period. And what is from here to here? This was half period. So you want these points to be separated by half period. But that's exactly what happens here. If you draw on the torus, what's the analog of that yellow cycle? That yellow cycle would be something like this. This would be the full cycle. And so if two points are separated by half cycle, they must be at a branch point. So this was like the yellow line. So half of it, which is what this is from here to here, must separate these two charges. Similarly, if you ask what is the other cycle, you would see the other cycle would be something like this. That would go here. As you go here, you cross here. Then you go here. Right? So you just go here and then on the other sheet. So you cross and you do this uh, genome. So that would be, so one cycle is this, the other cycle is this. And again, if you want to be separated by half a cycle, you need them to be exactly at a branch point. And so you conclude that in this way of describing Riemann surfaces, Riemann surfaces are just copies of the complex plane. And then uh, you have copies of the complex plane with cuts connecting the various sheets. And that's how you put genus. For example, if you put three cuts, it would be a genus two instead of genus one. And then you throw charges there. And their claim is that the charges will go to the branch points. 
And because they go to the branch point, the electric field turns out to be very simple. So then they write that the electric field just becomes the electric, becomes the electric field on the plane times an extra 1 over n factor. And from there, they derive, they check their heuristic guess. So they use it to explain for all genus why they would get this very simple result. So Yeah, so that's it. So the, the point then, it's just summarized, is that in string theory, scattering at very high energy is a classical process that you should really think as some strings that follow some classical trajectory. Really, we are extremizing, and we are not doing full path integral over all shapes. We are looking for the extremal shapes, the optimal solutions. That's what describes high energy scattering at fixed angle. It's big strings. They are big. They have some big shape. The shape is the electric field. It's just x is the electric field. It's just sum of propagators. So they are big. They are order one. They are big when the momenta are large. So they describe these big strings. At higher genus, this picture indicates that the string, the, the electric field, which is the location of the string, at higher genus, they are just copies of the plane. So the physical picture at higher genus is that if you look from outside, the surface looks very much the same as the surface of genus zero. So how could it be? What's going on? How can you get a surface that from far away, it's genus one but looks like genus zero? And the reason is that it's basically copies stacked on top of each other. So imagine you have a napkin or not a napkin, but imagine you have a sphere that you squeezed into a napkin. But this is still a sphere. Namely, there is still a cycle, but it's, it's very squeezed. It's a pillow that you squeezed. So that's a genus zero, right? Now let's put two pillows, one on top of each other. So this is genus zero, and I put one below here. And this is also genus zero, right? I just put two pillows, very small pillows, on top of each other. Do you agree? And now, glue them here. So now it's genus one. But from far, it looks like genus zero. So that's the picture of high energy scattering, is that it's a, it's a classical solution that ends up being stacked copies of genus zero. So this is how we get a genus one double pillow. And uh, it's similar for high energy behavior of string theory. We get some surface that end, at the end, the fact that the behavior of the exponent was so simple can be traced back to the fact that the shape itself is basically reproducing the shape of genus zero. Does it mean now that we can use this to completely compute the behavior of string theory non-perturbatively at high energy? No, because we only know the exponents, but to really resum everything, we need to know the prefactors, right? When you compute an exponent, if you know a, that you have a power, x to the n, you need to know the cn to see if it resums to an exponential, to a log, to whatever, right? So, and that, they have some partial control, but they don't control completely the prefactor. And therefore, they cannot yet do the resummation uh, of this case. I think this is a, 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 a problem that should be addressed in ADS-CFT, where we know the prefactors very well. And indeed, some people studied the analog of these problems, resumming diagrams in large N gauge theories. And there, we could trace the prefactors, and we could compute things exactly. And I think it would be a good opportunity to learn about high energy in those cases. <coughs> Hmm. 
OK. So I have to go to this talk. And I think anyway, I gave a general flavor of this paper. Uh, so yeah, like I said, uh, you will <laughs> when looking for papers, there will, you will find some ADS-CFT papers. For example, Aldheim Aldacena studied some minimal surfaces. So that's a, a natural reference to study. I think just this general picture, electrostatics, how do I count solutions? How do I think of this? And how do I use Morse theory to explain why 64 solutions? Uh, to me, it looks like very mysterious. Could be fun to discuss. These equations that follow from extremizing the energy that become equations for these charges, they have a name. They are called scattering equations. And they appeared recently in string theory in a very different context which is not about high energy, but about low energy scattering. And there, we don't care about one solution. We care about all the solutions, so all these 64 solutions. So someone could talk about scattering equations, and there is this scattering equation paper of Freddy and so on. So there are a bunch of interesting things to talk about. This paper is a tough paper. Uh, there is a lot to talk about. It's, it's a beautiful paper to learn lots of tricks that one day could be useful. But it's true that some of these things are very string theory-like. That if, uh, I mean, up to here, I think it's useful for everyone to know. But genus 2, only string theorists will ever, ever use a genus 2 surface, right? <laughs> but fine. OK. But genus 1, I think maybe everyone could find it. OK, so let's select who is going to present next week. So. So today, it's everyone, right? So I just randomize everyone, or uh, how is it? <coughs> Gabriel cannot come, or? Uh, so we assume not, not Gabriel. <coughs> Pam 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 pam. Okay, so Rodrigo, Francisco, João, Alan, Leandro, Dennis, and Egan. That's true? Ah, two Rodrigos. I need one more Rodrigo here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does someone have less presentation than others, and therefore? Oh, except two people that have three. Uh, so the people that have three, if they want, they can be excused this week, if you prefer. OK, so Al and I will remove. Who else has three? You can be on the list? OK. So OK, can you see? OK, so Francisco, then Rodrigo, then Dennis, then Egan. Uh, Rodrigo, uh, there is Rodrigo. OK, Francisco, Rodrigo, is there, then is an egg. Is it OK? So, so that's it. So that's good. So please write down somewhere. Oh, maybe I'll write it here as well. Francisco, Rodrigo, Dennis. And again.
replacement. It's a pain replacement. That's recommended on the They uh, recommend the sound with the flat gun. They find them at time of end. But this is not a good thing. No. We should, if you want to do scattering integration, I will do the original scattering yeah, integration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that they cite in there. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, yeah. Not to come with this, there's probably another known <laughs> case. To me? Ah, to cross the. Ah, but that's the. Ah, but you don't want to do a presentation, I don't know. Ah, but you only have two. Oh, it's just a little bit. But it's just a little bit. I don't know if you had two presentations.